Hi, I'm Dick Clay, and I'm president of the Filson Historical Society. I would like to welcome all of you to this event. We're so excited to be here uh, in the street hall of the Filson's Owsley Brown II History Center uh, with our partners from the St. James Court Art Show. Uh, we're here today for the unveiling of the magnificent poster that we all will see uh, that heralds the beginning of the art fair by the artist Mark Bird. It's very, very exciting to be in this partnership in this part of Louisville with the St. James um, Court Art Show and the St. James Court Association. Uh, this is a vital, important part of our city. It matters so much. It is so utterly beautiful in this part of Louisville. And we are so fortunate to have this uh, cacophony of Victorian and um, colonial revival houses everywhere around us. And it makes coming to the Filson fun for our staff, for our visitors, it makes the ability to come to the Filson and go to a program and then walk around St. James Court in Belgravia and up and down third and fourth and sixth and seventh. So we're very grateful to, and, and Brook and first and second as well. We're just very grateful to everybody for giving us this opportunity. Councilman David James is here with us and you'll be hearing from him. We have Howard Rosenberg and I'll turn this over to him in just a second and you'll meet the uh, spectacular artist uh, and hopefully we'll get to see his work. And now I'm gonna turn the program over to Howard Rosenberg, uh, the dreamer, the founding father, the person who makes this show go. Howard. Uh, thank you, Dick. Uh, and uh, again, I wanna welcome everybody. Um, you know, uh, whether you're here in person or virtually. I'm the executive director of the St. James Court Art Show. Uh, and we are excited again to continue this partnership with the Filson Historical Society. Uh, this is the official kick of, kickoff of the art show. It's the official unveiling of the art show print. The art show this year is October 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. Um, I wanna give a special thanks to the Filson and their staff for all the work that they've done to help put this event on. And I also wanna thank our marketing team from Cambium Marketing for all the work that they do, not just for this event, but throughout the year for the art show. Um, you know, this partnership started in 2019. We had a minor bump in the road in 2020. Uh, but I also want to give a special thanks to Julie James of the Filson for, be so, for being so instrumental in making this happen and uh, making this partnership what it is. You know, I, I consider the Filson Historical Society really the gateway to Old Louisville. And I've said that many times because this is that, that one place that, that when you look at it, it's like the Pink Palace or the Conrad Caldwell House. Everybody knows about the Filson and we really appreciate what you do for the community. As I said, we're here to unveil the 2021 Arch Hill print by renowned artist Mark Bird. This is a second in the series of a sense of place. But before I introduce Mark and Council President David James, both good friends of mine, and, and both have contributed greatly to this community in various ways. I, I do want to announce some exciting news that was announced not too long ago. We were recently named the number three art show of all time 
in, the, in America. And we were also recently named the number one art show in America for the decade 2010 to 2020 uh, by Sunshine Artist Magazine. And there's some people I wanna thank because uh, I get to stand up and say a few words, but there are a lot of people behind the scenes that really make this show happen. I just get out of the way and let it happen. But I do wanna thank Dr. Robert Powell, uh, president of the St. James Court Association. And I also wanna thank these people, Karen Clayton, who's the assistant director of the art show. I uh, wanna thank Connie Light, the director of the Belgravia section, Rick Serpa, the co-director of the Belgravia section, Elaine Steele, the director of the Fourth Street section, Mary Martin, director of the Third Street section, Larry Askins, di director of the 1300 section, and I also wanna thank Reverend D'Artagna Hill from the West End Baptist Church. And I do want to take a, a moment to thank my predecessor, Margie Esrock, who was executive director before I started in 2018. She was the executive director in 2010. So a lot of the accolades and the credits for the success of this show and being named the number one show for the decade uh, goes to her. So a great shout out to her. I also wanna thank all the other directors, the volunteers, everybody that's made this show happen over the last 65 years. But I guess more importantly, I wanna thank the artists, the artists who come from all over the United States uh, for what they do and what they have contributed to the show because without the artists uh, and the level of artists that we do have at this show, we wouldn't be where we are today. <clears throat> I don't believe anyone envisioned in 1957 that 14 artists who hung their art on a clothesline would have been the start of an art show that has grown to over 650 artists from all over the United States and visited by over 250,000 patrons. It is now my great pleasure to introduce a gentleman who's been very supportive uh, more than supportive. He's been a good friend of the art show in all of old Louisville. Uh, he's a good friend of mine and uh, I really respect the work that he's done in this community, not just old Louisville, but throughout the city of Metro Louisville. And that is my good friend, council president, David James. Well, thank you, Howard. Um, I wanna thank, um, um, the Filson for allowing us to be here. Uh, they're one of the great anchors of our community, of our city. And I just want to say thank you, first of all. Uh, secondly, I want to say um, kudos to Howard Rosenberg uh, for carrying on the tradition of the St. James Art Show. Um, for 65 years, this show has meant so much to this part of our city, Old Louisville. Um, it the art show, um, 65 years old, 250,000 people coming to visit. It's so important that the Jefferson County Public School System makes it an in-service day for teacher training, which means they get to go to the art show. Um, and that's important. And so um, for our city, um, for Old Louisville, the art show helps shape the character of this part of our city with the Victorian homes and the history that we have here, having the art show and having so many people come to Old Louisville uh, to participate in it is vital to the economic stability and vitality of our city, but not only that for the citizens that live here. And the, the people that you named earlier, Howard, that all volunteer their time uh, to put on the art show and make it what it is, um, it's amazing. And, and so I don't know of anything like it anywhere else in the country. And so to know that we have this here in Louisville, in old Louisville, uh, is a, a blessing. And I just want to say to everybody, I'm so excited. The first weekend of October, once again, will be the St. James Art Show and everybody needs to come down. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, it is now my great pleasure to uh, introduce the artist 
uh, that created this year's art print, the second in a series of Sense of Place. You know, in 1981, uh, Mark Bird and his uncle Sonny Whittle created the first St. James Court art show print. Uh, Mark Bird really is the inspiration, the driving force behind this series of prints that are being created, a sense of place. He, he is a world renowned watercolor artist. You know, his uncle Malcolm Bird was one of the founders of the St. James Court Art Show. Um, he is also a, a great friend and has worked tirelessly over the years, like the volunteers and the other directors of the show to make this show what it is today. Um, so we're here to see him and we're here to unveil the print. So I introduce Mr. Mark Bird. Good morning. Thank you, Howard. I'm sure I can't live up to that introduction. Uh, I am uh, more than just a little bit honored to be with you today, speaking about one of my most favorite subjects. And I thank you for this opportunity. In contrast with the St. James Court Art Show tradition of posters and prints of the past, which started in 1981, this fine art series, A Sense of Place, which began in 2019, will focus on the place, St. James Court. We will explore the vast history of the court, its broad architectural styles, colorful residents, there have been some colorful residents, and contributions to the fabric of Louisville through the medium of watercolor. The print series features the highest quality G. Clay fine art reproductions in signed and numbered editions of 100 prints. These reproductions are printed on 100% cotton archival paper using pigmented inks, which offer light fastness up to 200 years. That should work. I will add an original pencil remark of the St. James Court Fountain to each print in the series. The renowned historian and my friend, Stephen Brown, will contribute his original research into Old Louisville and St. James Court history by writing about the subject of each year's edition. Art is, art is one thing, but art that teaches you something is at a whole different level. Each print edition in this collection will be released on an annual basis for a period of 10 years. The prints are priced at $200 and will be available at the art show and shortly on the art show's website, stjamescourtartshow.com. That is stjamescourtartshow.com. The inescapable charm of the Kauai, excuse me, the Kauai House, circa 1958. That's the title of this year's print. The subject of the second print in the collection, A Sense of Place, will always live in a special place in my heart. At the holiday season, for many years during my childhood, my family and I would visit my uncle, Malcolm Bird, in his newly renovated home. Newly renovated home. At 1436 St. James Court. He and his friends, Bob Smith and Jim Perry, purchased this grand residence in 1955. Its condition was deplorable by anyone's standards. And through their collective vision and personal tireless work, they transformed it into a place of grandeur of uncompromised style and elegance. Having familiarity with only the interior of this magnificent setting as a child, I thought it was a natural fit to now be able to translate my memories and emotions into the second print in our series. Now, it was no small order to paint 
any emotion. But I knew my vivid memories of that glorious environment would serve me well. The Portuguese word saudade translates into an intense longing or nostalgia for the past. Bittersweet would be the current English expression. I most certainly called upon my past experiences and my longing to return to the Kawain house when I began this painting. And now with a little assistance, I'd like to unveil it for you. We're gonna, we have the um, original in the center flanked by two prints. And I'll explain it to you after you can see it. Whoops. The scene depicted in this painting is that of the interior of the living room on the first floor, as though the viewer was standing at the fireplace mantel. On the wall above the mantel was a surface of antiqued mirror tiles, which reflected the opposite wall of this room. On this wall hung in salon style, was the beginnings of a collection of works by European masters. These works were acquired by these young men during tours of Europe, starting in 1952. Sitting directly in front of this mirrored wall was a pair of French empire, gilt bronze, winged victory candelabra from Paris, a small bronze, bust of Plato collected in Florence, Italy, and the French brass carriage clock also acquired in Paris. Hanging from the ceiling was an antique French crystal and bronze candle chandelier. It was raised and lowered by means of a pulley system to change the candles. I can easily understand now that experiencing this environment as a child would leave an indelible impression on the visual world I was to inhabit as an adult. And I'm so thankful for the time spent in this magical place. The work that these three young men performed on this house led to work on other homes on St. James, which then led to trailblazing work on Belgravia Court this work was the seed of a preservation movement, which resulted in the creation of an historic preservation district known as Old Louisville in 1974. One can easily see all these years later that the faces of historic preservation in Louisville were those of Malcolm Byrd, Bob Smith and Jim Perry and I am forever grateful for my time spent in the presence of these visionaries. Their wisdom, foresight, and talents steered this neighborhood to new life. And if that wasn't sufficient, they helped to fund its future care by establishing our beloved art show. I am honored to represent the St. James Court Art Show through this print series and thank them for their continued trust and support in this journey. I would also like to thank the Filson Historical Society for their unique partnership with the art show and their generosity in hosting this event today. 
Thank you to our speakers today. And I would love to take this opportunity to invite all of you back to your St. James Court Art Show, October 1st to 3rd. Thank you. You know, when I, I first saw this, I was just, it was wow. And uh, understanding the story behind it is just incredible. And so we're very honored to have this now the second in the series. You know, and I, I do want to say something. That, you know, those of us that live in this neighborhood uh, are stewards uh, of this neighborhood. And I view myself as a steward of the art show. Uh, because I'll be gone and someone else will step in and do a phenomenal job. But these art prints will be uh, forever. Uh, and, and that's really important. So I thank everybody for attending the press conference, the formal press conference. And I know that uh, Mark mentioned noted historian Stephen Brown. Um, he has done an incredible job in, in, in looking at the history of this phenomenal neighborhood. And I'd like to introduce him uh, to say a few words and show your video. And uh, we will see you October 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. And uh, thank you all so much. Well, first, I'd like to thank Mark Bird for um, generously inviting me to uh, contribute in a small way to the history behind these wonderful prints. I'd like to thank Howard and, and Robert for supporting that effort to do so. Um, so what we're going to see is we're going to see a short video that gives the history really of the birth of the preservation movement in Louisville, which was born in the room depicted in Mark's uh, wonderful prints. Uh, also, um, in time for the art show, we'll also post a short video of Mark talking about the print. And then after that, we'll have the complete interviews that, of the subjects that you'll see in the short video. So thanks so much, um, Dr. Clay and everyone at the Filson for hosting this wonderful event. And without further ado, the video. Hello, I'm Mark Bird. It is my esteemed pleasure to bring to you today this conversation about the rebirth of St. James and Belgravia courts, what then led to the greater rehabilitation of the entire neighborhood. You're going to meet some people who knew the players at the time in the mid 50s and later. You're going to meet some people who knew of their actions at the time. It is an awesome opportunity for us to tell this story in a way that becomes uh, human, to tell you about the people who were, who were doing this work without any kind of recognition. They were doing it because it was the right thing to do. And lo, these years later, many years later, we are offering this meager amount of recognition as a testament to their hard work and eagerness to see this area maintained and given new life. I hope you enjoy this conversation. It has been my pleasure to be a part of it and bring it to you. Please enjoy. I'm Sean Williams. I'm a native of Louisville. And in 2005, my husband and I moved from Washington, D.C. to uh, old Louisville to find a home for our family. And uh, we settled on Belgravia Court and restored this beautiful uh, chateau-esque building, which had been a multi-unit for decades and we restored it back to a single family home that it originally was. It's known as the William Wathen House, and we're very privileged to be here. 
So I'm Bruce Kiesling. Uh, I'm not native to Louisville. I'm native to New York State. Uh, but I also moved to Louisville from Washington, D.C. Uh, I did not know Sean and her family. Uh, I moved to Louisville in 1998 uh, to come here for work and didn't immediately settle in Louisville. Uh, rented in Crescent Hill for a while as I got to know the city. But while living in Washington, D.C., I lived on Capitol Hill, uh, which is also a beautifully, uh, mostly restored uh, historic district and was looking ultimately for something similar and found old, old Louisville and have been living in the same house here on Belgravia Court since 2000. My name is Mark Koonsman, K-U-N-Z-M-A-N. I was born in New Albany, Indiana in 1940. Um, and I lived in Louisville for several years after I got out of the Air Force and moved back over here to Indiana in the seven, in 76 um, and built a house up in Floyd's Knobs and then came to this property about 26 years ago. So uh, when I was working, I'm retired now, um, I had a business with another fellow where we installed fabrics, wall coverings, and did full finishes for designers in Louisville and Lexington and Danville. I'm Nancy Woodcock. I uh, grew up uh, in North Carolina I, uh, in a small town in Rutherfordton, not too far from Asheville. Um, following graduation from college, I moved to New York uh, and worked at, as a nurse and uh, worked at Columbia Presbyterian uh, where I met my husband. Lived in New York City for about 15 years and uh, before I moved to to Louisville. Uh, my name is Tom Woodcock. Uh, I grew up in upstate New York, a small college town, and uh, went to college in Pennsylvania and went to graduate school in New York City. Worked there, uh, got married, worked there for uh, 16 years, and moved to Louisville uh, with Nancy and two kids in uh, 1980. Uh, Louisville's been our home ever since. Uh, but, uh, wonderful place. My name is Jim Porter. Uh, I'm a retired interior designer. Uh, both my wife and I grew up in Iowa and moved to Louisville in 1971. My name is Rick Light. I'm from Indianapolis originally. I came here a little after Connie. I came in October of 77. And uh, when I rented the apartment, third floor, as she said, I said, when can I move in? And uh, Bob Rice said, oh. First of the month, I said, great. I went home, got all my stuff, showed up here. <laughs> first day of the month was the first Saturday of the month, which happened to be an art show weekend. <laughs> nobody so told you. Nobody told me. So. My name is Connie Light. Um, I was moved to Louisville under duress. I got lost um, trying to find a place to live. They sent me out to Iroquois Park. Thank God I got lost. And I found a park and I thought, oh, I'm there. But it was Central Park. And I ended up on St. James Court. And I knew I was home. Uh, I have the great fortune of having been related to Malcolm Bird, the pioneer, we call him, of St. James Court. And among many things, Malcolm was my uncle. He was also my mentor in many ways. Um, he, he was obviously invested in the history of the neighborhood. It was very important to him that he live in an area filled with history. So when he moved to St. James Court, he and Bob Smith, who were friends, and Jim Perry, they all pooled their money and bought the house at 1436 St. James. That house is known as the Kawain House, named for Madison J. Kawain, the poet laureate who at one point lived there. It was Malcolm and Bob and Jim's foresight that they understood that this neighborhood at that time was falling into disrepair. But when I lived on the court, uh, it was a lot different from what it is now. 
it was surrounded by an area that was pretty seedy. So if you got off the court, you had to kind of be careful at night and that sort of thing. So that's all changed, and it's really a good thing to see the transition. Um, but I enjoyed the time living there. It was very convenient, entertaining people. There were some real characters living on the court then. <laughs> so there's always, always something going on that was interesting. Well, I started to learn about the area through volunteerism and uh, became engaged in uh, uh, learning about the area and found that many of my neighbors had restored their homes as well. And we all have a passion for uh, these, these buildings, this architecture, the history. And uh, my husband and I came from other areas that had old homes, uh, um, Alexandria, Virginia, and my husband from New Jersey. So we, we became very involved in, in the community, and then I met a Bruce, and we, he taught me that we were stumbling upon an anniversary of sorts, uh, the, the uh, 50th anniversary of Restoration, Inc., which started the preservation movement of Louisville, and it started in old Louisville, and I'll let him explain I forget the year, I think it was around 2010. Uh, in reading the Courier Journal, I found the obituary of J. Douglas Nunn, who was a Courier Journal reporter. And in reading his obituary, I, I, I saw that he was involved in Restoration Inc., which I had heard uh, through living on the court, I'd heard through the years, you know, lore and legends about uh, the restoration of. Uh, Belgravia Court, but but really didn't know much more about it beyond kind of the, the, the general neighborhood legends that are trafficked in. And uh, reading his obituary, I became curious enough to know more about Restoration Inc. and in particular what his role uh, was. So I reached out and contacted his daughter, uh, who is still alive in, in Nashville, Tennessee. And, and through that, uh, as Sean mentioned, realized that <clears throat> in 2012, we would have the 50th anniversary of Restoration Inc. and and the the really the catalyst for what became um, uh, designating Old Louisville as a landmark district and and what we understand today as historic preservation here in Louisville. Although that was not the original outs, that wasn't really the primary goal for Restoration Inc. and what Doug Nunn and others were doing. All of the houses were bought as a group. In fact, they paid 110000 for like nine different residences. So for all, 110 for all nine. And, you know, that was um, a, a project, and that's really what helped kickstart. You know, St. James was always in good shape. Uh, those families had kind of made them steady, et cetera, but the rest of the neighborhood had fallen down a little bit. And uh, so part of that Restoration Inc. group, and Bob being the chief designer, uh, came through and really reconditioned all those houses. They did it at cost. That's the amazing thing. They weren't trying to make a profit. Uh, they were doing it to really kickstart. And the interesting thing is this might not even have been the neighborhood. And uh, the... Uh, the team, they actually looked at Portland for a bit, but they couldn't get the house. enough houses in one mm -hmm. cluster. They couldn't get enough sellers at one time because they wanted to have a, a density. And then they came over here and got numerous houses all to sell at the same time. So once they were in that house and were successful in in turning the tide on the condition there and the, the look of that place, they then went next door and did the same thing. Uh, and then neighbors started taking note of, oh, these guys have incredible taste and talent. Let's get their opinion of what we're trying to do over here across the street. So they then became sort of the architectural review board, if you will, for the court and would offer color, design, sense, services, whatever. 
as a as a way to build this cohesive, beautiful place in which to live. Bob and Malcolm and Jim Perry and a few others um, got me involved with the neighborhood because I fell in love with the architecture. And so I had to know more about it. And uh, they introduced me to Clotilde Brokaw and Chloe was passionate about this. For instance, I'll just talk about Chloe. She was passionate about the area and she was convinced that we needed to get historic zoning. And she was convinced that the airport was a menace, the noise from the airport. So she is the one that financed by herself um, surveys done by national people and they set up all the equipment to measure the vibrations on the court, on the houses theoretically, um, and found that it, they were detrimental to, but nobody cared. So Chloe and a woman named Winnie Chamberlain, who was a single female who owned a house about four down on Belgravia, but she was an architect. I never met a female architect before. And she said, we got to get historic zoning because if we can get historic zoning, they will protect us. That will protect us from anything encroaching and, and possibly destroying our neighborhood. So Winnie said, do it. Chloe said, I'll finance it. So they brought in all the survey equipment and came back and yes, the plane's flying over were a problem for the glass, the type of glass it was. It's not the modern glass, on and on and on. Then there was all this discussion, while well, all this is going on, about widening the expressway or an expressway ramp, which would threaten this neighborhood. And then everybody got interested um, that St. James would actually be impacted. And Chloe had the solution. Carol and I did not like seeing the things that were happening to some of the houses in Old Louisville, where they were being torn down or they were being threatened. And we decided there had to be a, a good way to save it. So, and I have no idea where we got it, but we ended up getting a plot map of Old Louisville. And it had, it was a line drawing, showed all of the streets, all of the houses in Old Louisville. Uh, went over to the expressway, and I think it stopped at the expressway, went to the railroad tracks on the west, um, Broadway on the north, and I think it went close to U of L on the south. And we took it upon ourselves to do a survey of what houses were there that were, and I forget where we took it back to now. But with the with the city directories and stuff, we took it back to someplace around that there was a time when, and and you may be able to help me, help me out on that when they changed the numbering of the houses in Old Louisville. So we, we went back to that point, and went through the the microfiche at the library and and whatever sources we could find in the city directories and and on this map, we highlighted with markers, all of the houses that were in place at that point that are still here. And I think that was at, that was at the time that the city was getting ready to designate a historic district in Old Louisville. And they were gonna take a small part, they were gonna take St. James, Belgravia, maybe Third Street, up to Central Park and then stop at Hill, just make a small preservation district. A historic district and and in conversations with with Bob and you know is it that's that's silly just to make it that size the other houses are just as significant as the wonderful ones on third and fourth and Belgravia and St. James so we took the map and and worked on that and and did the research and found out that all of those houses they had they were there you know back in the turn of the century. 
and took it to the Board of Aldermen and made a presentation and said, look, if you're gonna make it a whole historic district, don't stop at Third Street. You know, take all the houses within, from the, from the Waterson to the or 65, to the railroad tracks and north and south. And so they ended up making it larger and, and designating that large area as a historic district. And I think it's an important uh, historical fact that if you, if you start around 3rd and 4th Street in Old Louisville, the, the houses are huge. And, and some of them, of course, are just magnificent, but also uh, impractical. You know, six or 7,000 square feet with a big garage and carriage house, uh, really not easily usable in, in today's world. And then as you come further east in old Louisville, uh, through second and third onto Brook and Floyd, the houses become more modest. They're, they're newer overall. But I, I think that was one of the important things that Bob pointed out is you didn't have to have a grand house with a big master staircase and Tiffany glass hanging from the, from the ceiling to have a house that had historical roots and, and was really, really a beautiful piece of work. The court, on St. James Court, I can see the influence that Bob and, and uh, Malcolm and Jim had down there just by knowing what was there originally when they took part in it, I should say, and saw the potential and started working there. Um, anybody who knew them and there's still a few of us around who did, um, has to appreciate their foresight. Uh, and it was exciting then, too, because, as I say, it was back during a time when those properties were affordable uh, to buy and work up, to work over, to renovate and redo. Um, interesting to see it from that point, having known it at that point, and see what it is now. Um, and that's expanded a great deal because I had a friend who lived over on 2nd Street back during the period of the 60s and 70s, and that was not a particularly nice neighborhood. It's very nice now. So that whole thing from the court has spread out, um, expanded to 6th Street, 2nd, uh, 3rd, uh, all that area. 3rd Street's always been pretty upscale, but... Um, it's expanded, and I think that was the brain, that was the the epicenter. That's what started it. So, um, you know, to to have known the people that were instrumental in that, it, that's pretty important. I think, pretty special. The beauty of this neighborhood is the gentleman that restored it, and one of the things that Jim Perry did was to make sure that. Um, we got gas lights, no matter what the cost, we needed the gas lights. And that is what the court is known for. And these were individual preferences. Uh, Bob Smith and Malcolm, Bob had this impeccable taste. But I could came back from work one day and Nancy and I, we would sit and rehash the day in the back porch. And I suddenly realized <laughs> this had been transformed. This space was so comfortable and so nice for what we were doing. And it, it so, sort of the first time it clicked that, that, that this guy was a genius that with the little work that he had done, I mean, it, it, this wasn't, there was no la di da anything. It was just this sort of basic redecorating with some furniture and some color and some wood and so on. But it just became our favorite place in the house. It was magnificent. Just and, and it, it's sort of the, the recognition that uh, designers and decorators really, it, it really is an art and it really does matter. I mean, it changed, it changed the way I looked and felt at the house. And I told them, I remember at one time I told them, I said, Bob, you know, I didn't, I wasn't quite sure what you did, but now I know. <laughs> <laughs> so a, a lot of what they did uh, was a, a, a transformation of beauty rather than a restoration to the way it was in 1890. I think they did a fabulous job. Uh, and, and I think a lot of the things that they did did back then in 1962 make Belgravia, you know, the premier walking court of the city. And frankly, of many of the urban places that we have lived and seen. I mean, you, go to, you go to places like D.C., Philadelphia, Boston, they don't have something that is 
that is as beautiful and as special as Belgravia is. So Restoration Inc. was launched, launched in 1962. Uh, frankly, it wasn't a financial success for them. Um, I think they barely got out, you know, without losing more money. Not all, all 10 of the homes were not even completed by the time Restoration Inc. had to wrap up. But, but they did meet their goal in demonstrating to the city that uh, preserving the, this, these architectural assets had value. And, and should require the energy and focus of the city. So that's what they need to be remembered for. Anybody can give money, right? But he gave purpose and direction. He and Malcolm and the others that I have named, Chloe and Winnie, smart enough to get the federal landmarks for these homes. And if any kind of luck, yeah, they'll be here long after they're gone. And me gone, because you know, I have nowhere else to go. And there are enough boxes in Louisville to move me. So I'm here. 